Sir Edward Trenton Richards is a Bermuda national hero for many reasons. One of these is his work building bridges between Bermuda and the African diaspora, particularly in the Caribbean. The African diaspora is a layered concept, including the historic dispersal of African peoples to destinations outside of the continent, as well as the ongoing interactions between diaspora communities, whether located at home in Africa or abroad. Likewise, scholars such as Frank Manning and Dr. Eva Hudson have argued that Bermuda is part of the Caribbean, and though some conclude otherwise, it is important to recognize that Bermuda's place within the Caribbean is based on historic associations within the region and the relationships of our people. So as we focus on the life of Sir Edward Trenton Richards, let us reflect on his work in journalism, tourism, and politics for examples of how he developed and maintained relationships with the African diaspora in the Caribbean and beyond. Born and raised in British Guyana, Richards arrived in Bermuda in 1930 to teach at the Barclay Institute. His sister Pearl had been in Bermuda since the 1920s, and she had informed her younger brother of the teaching vacancy and even sent a ticket for him. The headmaster of Barclay at the time was Mr. George de Costa, who had led the school since it opened in 1897. Similar to E.T., Bermuda had become DeCosta's new home after relocating from Jamaica. DeCosta was also the editor of the Bermuda Recorder newspaper, and in 1933 he persuaded Richards to become a part-time reporter for the paper. DeCosta also then pressed him to take on more responsibility, and soon Richards was associate editor. <clears throat> he even worked at acting editor when de Costa passed away in August 1934. And though Richard's legal and political careers took him away from a life of journalism, Richard's remained a constant contributor to the paper right into the 1960s. However, in order to appreciate the significance of Richard's work in this field, we must understand the role of the recorder. The recorder had been established in the summer of 1925 by five members of the Garvey Alfred Ron Place, R. James Ravine, David Augustus, Henry Hughes, and Joker Mott. Its creation was informed by Marcus Garvey's philosophy of black business development, as well as in resistance to white elite attempts to isolate and silence black remedies. During this era of racial segregation and de facto political disfranchisement, white owned newspapers did very little to cover the black community. And even when blacks were mentioned in the paper, it was rarely in a positive light. In response, A.B. Place and his compatriots created a public media platform where blacks could discuss the issues most concerning to their communities. Drawing inspiration from Garvey's Negro World newspaper, the Garvey, excuse me, <laughs> the recorder rather, included news from black diaspora communities as well as Africa. Consequently, the recorder was a crucial line of communication ensuring that Bermudians were not isolated from the wider black world. The recorder covered stories including labor uprisings from the Great Depression and decolonization attempts throughout the Caribbean. From America, it reported on the celebration of Negro History Week, the murder of Emmett Till, and other flashpoints in the African-American civil rights movement. From England, it reported on housing and employment discrimination faced by Caribbean immigrants, as well as the performances of local athletes like Alma Champagne. Meanwhile, in Africa, it covered events such as the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, the injustices of apartheid in South Africa, and the activism of many independence leaders. The recorder also traveled abroad, being mailed and cure packages to loved ones living away, or being carried by departing locals as they boarded ships and planes. Through its pages, the recorder shared glimpses of black Bermudian life with international readers. As an editor, therefore, Richards had to be mindful of not only his own views, but also his community's perspectives. We see that in the internal dynamics of the paper. Richards, a relatively new Guyanese associate editor, worked under the direction of George de Costa, a seasoned Jamaica edit Jamaican editor, to prepare a publication earned by A.B. Place, a Bermudian, in fulfillment of the paper's mission to serve as a voice for the Black Bermudian community. We see this exercise in cultural translation was not always perfect, neither was it always seamless. However, the widespread support for the recorder during Richard's tenure 
as well as the widespread support for the recorder after he left, together with the accolades and debates that were initiated by his editorials, shows that for most of the time, Richards had his finger on the pulse of his new home community. For example, on the 100th anniversary of emancipation, E.T.'s editorial remarked that it was whites who needed to be mentally emancipated from racial prejudice. In 1936, he condemned the Bermudian government for selecting an all-white team to represent the island at the Summer Olympics in Berlin. Richard sarcastically mentioned that even the United States, the land of the Ku Klux Klan and the seat of lynching, was wise enough to temporarily set aside racism in order to select winning black athletes like Jesse Owens. By its editorial and other reporting, the recorder put the African diaspora on notice regarding Bermuda's racial discrimination and unequal franchise. By the late 1930s, Caribbean intellectuals were describing Bermuda as one of the most reactionary colonial administrations in the Western Hemisphere. While some African-American newspapers on the East Coast were comparing the island to the Jim Crow South, saying that it was as bad as Alabama. These negative descriptions of Bermuda's social conditions presented a potential problem for an island that was dependent on tourism. So let us turn our attention to Richard's work in tourism. After studying law in London during the Second World War, Richards opened a small practice in Hamilton, and it was through his work as a lawyer and then later as a member of parliament that Richards began to play important roles in black tourism. Following the war, the government initiated plans to expand tourism. However, their efforts were accompanied by the private actions of black entrepreneurs. Travel agents like Hilton Hill, a former student of Richards at Barclay, and Donald Smith, were also arranging vacation packages for African Americans and Caribbean tourists to visit Bermuda. Likewise, guest house owners like Lillian and Archie Miners promoted their properties privately to African Americans. Consequently, blacks comprised an increasing share of the island's post-war tourist arrivals. It was around this time that Richards became directly involved in tourism by accepting an invitation to join the board of directors of the Imperial Hotel the largest black-owned hotel at the time. Board members appreciated E.T.'s legal expertise and he was elected president of the board by 1955. In his tourism rule, Richards contacted black visitors from across the Atlantic world. For example, E.T. met the very first black president of Hampton University, Dr. Alonzo Maroon, when Maroon and his wife were vacationing in Bermuda in March 1954. Maroon was originally from the Virgin Islands before he relocated to the United States. And both E.T. Richards and Dr. Maroon were both members of Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, and they shared an intolerance for racial discrimination. Dr. Maroon was a well-known civil rights activist and advocate, not only for his students, but also for the wider African-American community. Meanwhile, Richards worked on behalf of the Black Bermudian community to challenge white oligarchs in the House of Assembly. Unfortunately though, Bermuda's racial climate had not improved and segregation remained an obstacle for black residents and tourists alike. So as tourism increased during the 1950s, so did incidents of rejection and embarrassment when black tourists attempted to book rooms or be served meals in segregated establishments. Many black visitors were turned away from the doors of Bermuda's segregated hotels, such as Guyanese politician, Frank McDavid, who was actually on his way to be knighted when he was rejected by Bermuda's hotels, as well as the African-American performer Sarah Vaughan. Sometimes diaspora networks were engaged to avoid these kinds of problems. For example, the Richards family hosted Grantley Adams, the Prime Minister of Barbados in March 1956 when he was traveling through the island. Meanwhile, Hilton Hill had been meeting with blacks in the hospitality industry to form an organization to promote Bermudian tourism to blacks in the U.S. and other parts of the Caribbean. The resulting organization was established in 1957 and was named the Bermuda Resort Association, and E.T. Richards was its president, and Wesley Gale of Sunset Lodge, its vice president. Under Richards' leadership, the Bermuda Resort Association began the process of desegregating the business of tourism, which had previously restricted its private funding along racial lines. Richard's somewhat 
forgotten role promoting black tourism is critical because it connects his politics with the concept of diaspora. Through his work on the Interracial Committee, the Hotel Keepers Act Committee, and his drafting of the Restaurant Act in 1960, Richards was a major force in challenging segregation at the legislative level. Richards viewed segregation on multiple levels. Firstly, he believed segregation was an ethical matter of right and wrong. Next, he understood that segregation was an issue that undermined the equal citizenship of Bermudians. Thirdly, as someone who had made Bermuda his new home and was now working in black tourism, Richards was intimately aware of how segregation hampered diasporic relationships. And finally, Richards realized the detrimental effects of segregation on black businesses in the hospitality sector. Therefore, the passage of legislation to extend the gains of the theater boycott and other activist efforts of this time were both beneficial locally and diasporic. Bermuda's progress in matters of race, or lack thereof, and significance within the African diaspora was symbolized in 1963 when E.T. Richards welcomed His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie I, on October 9th. Richards also had the pleasure of meeting His Majesty's granddaughter, Her Imperial Highness Ruth Desta. And while many celebrated the fact that Ethiopia had now stretched forth her hands to greet Bermuda, the occasion marked Bermuda's need for further progress, because out of the 16 Bermudian dignitaries welcoming the Emperor, Richards was the only black person. In this event, we witnessed the importance of E.T. Richards as a first-class man in an unjust context that often tried to treat him and other black Bermudians as second-class citizens. And so despite his success, the struggle for justice continued. This is a point worthy of remembering in these times of global protest against racial inequality and police brutality sparked off by viral videos of people such as Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd, and not to mention the news of Breonna Taylor. And yet now, here we are. Here we are at this moment to recognize the life and the work of Edward Trenton Richards as a Bermuda national hero in 2020. Understanding his use of journalism, his engagement with black tourism, and his advocacy in politics were not only designed to benefit Bermuda, but also to develop and maintain relationships with the African diaspora in the Caribbean and beyond. Happy National Heroes Day and respect to the legacy of Sir Edward Trenton Richards.